so I'm, I'm just truly honored to, to, to be here. I, I want to speak for a few moments about um, my last book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And it actually came largely out of my previous book, Stamped from the Beginning, which was a narrative history of, of racist ideas. It, in this book, Stamped from the Beginning, literally chronicled the entire history of, of racist ideas. But, but in writing that book, I didn't want to just write about specifically anti-black racist ideas. I also wanted to chronicle those ideas that were challenging anti-black racist ideas. I wanted to give the reader a sense of the types of ideas that they could be thinking in contrast or instead of these racist ideas. And I found that historically, those who were producing those ideas were, in today's parlance, calling those ideas not racist ideas. That pretty much every progenitor of racist ideas made the case in their era that their ideas were, were not racist. So I knew I couldn't use that term. <laughs> I knew I couldn't classify the opposite of racist ideas as as not racist ideas. And so I landed and used the term that had been used by scholars for, for quite some time, which was anti-racist ideas. And so I ended up writing this history of racist and anti-racist ideas. And of course, I went out speaking about this book. And most of my talks were on college campuses and, and universities. And typically, I would sort of urge students to adopt more anti-racist ideas. And typically in the Q&A sessions, people would be like, what do you mean anti-racist ideas? Like, I've never heard that term before. What do you mean? How can I be an anti-racist? I've been taught to be not racist. I am not racist. And, and so, you know, on college campus after college campus, you had students basically asking me, how can I be an anti-racist? And ultimately, I realized that I should probably answer that question. And fundamentally, when I was beginning the process of, of writing this, this book that I actually didn't want to write, um, I, I wanted to think very deeply about sort of what would be the fundamental sort of underlying sort of narrative pulse um, of the text. In other words, what what is essentially, what is the heartbeat of anti-racism? And, and, and fundamentally, I realized through my last work that typically those who were being racist, those who were expressing racist ideas, those who were supporting racist policies were typically saying they're not racist, they were typically saying their ideas are not racist. They were typically saying their policies are not racist. Really, they were only, the only sort of debate was how deeply they were in denial. So, you know, some people say things like, I'm the least racist person anywhere in the world, <laughs> right? And, and then you have others who just say, I'm not racist, right? So it was, it was some sort of in between those two extremes. But, but fundamentally, it was this denial. And so I realized that really the heartbeat of, of racism itself has always been denial. And, and then I realized that, so thereby the contrast to that, the opposite of denying one's racism is admitting, is confessing, is acknowledging one's racism is admitting that one has indeed just expressed a racist idea. As many of you know, when, when typically someone in America is charged with saying something that's racist or doing something that's racist, what's their first response? No, no, I'm not racist. And that's the typical response indeed of someone who is indeed being racist, while an anti-racist would actually have the capacity to admit Yes, indeed, that was a racist idea. Yes, indeed, I am supporting a racist policymaker. Yes, indeed, I need to transform and change myself. And so I realized, again, that this, I wanted to sort of show, I wanted really the heartbeat of the book itself to be this confession, to be this constant confession. And obviously, in order 
to confess, one has to self-reflect. And as an historian, I was like, okay, let me find a character in, in American history who actually did this, who was willing to constantly sort of self-reflect and, and confess the times in which they were being racist. And, and I searched and I searched, <laughs> and I couldn't find anyone <laughs> who were willing to consistently you know, admit and confess those times in which they were being racist. And so unfortunately, I had to use the very character I didn't want to use, and, and that was myself. And so really, the, the, the how to be an anti-racist really tells my story of, of how I came to be this high school senior who 20 years ago gave an MLK speech at this MLK competition. And in that speech, I pretty much gave this litany of anti-black ideas in which I thought fundamentally the problem, the racial problem, was black people, but not just specifically black people, black youth. And, and I came of age in, in the 1990s, and if there was ever a decade in American history in which black youth were considered the American problem, were considered the menace to society, it was the 1990s. And, and it was black youth, we were constantly told that, that we were super predators, that we were violent, that we didn't value education, that we were having too many children. And you know, as a black youngster, I ended up consuming these anti-black ideas, and I ended up expressing them in this speech. And so the book opens with this speech that I gave. And indeed, it's quite possibly, no it is, the most shameful sort of moment of my life. I can't even put on the, we have like a video, what, did, what was it before the DVD? A cassette? Um, a VHS, yeah, like, <laughs> I, I can't even look at it, you know, it's because it's so shameful. And, and, and so really the book tracks how I came to believe that the racial problem was black people. And, and I should say that one of the things that I seek to do in, in, the, in, the, in the book is really fundamentally sort of show that, that America has always had racial inequality. We've always had racial disparities. And we've always been arguing over why those racial disparities and inequities exist. And there's always been two positions. There's been the racist position and the anti-racist position. And historically, the, the racist position has, has said things like, indeed, black people are the problem. That, indeed, black people are fit for slavery. That, indeed, black people need to be segregated and incarcerated and, and, and deported. While the anti-racist position has, has largely said, no, actually, the problem has been racism. The problem has been racist power and policy. And, and really, we've been arguing from the beginning over what is the problem or who is the problem. And for the better part of American history, not only have people articulated the racist position, but they've also said that position is not racist. And, and Americans commonly believe that they're not racist partly because they believe there's a such thing as a not racist. And also, even more importantly, we have yet to define racist and even anti-racist in a very clear and consistent way that people can understand and apply to themselves. And so really, not only is this sort of the, the heartbeat of the book, my constant sort of confession, those times in which I was thinking that there was something wrong with people as opposed to policy, but it's also sort of anchored, each chapter is, is anchored on these very clear definitions. Because in many ways, when, when people say, when you have a politician 
who says something like, majority black Baltimore is a rat and rodent infested mess that no one would want to, no human being would want to live in. And then he turns around and say, he's not racist. And, and then when you have the house rep from that district indeed challenging those ideas, and then he's called racist, what, what's happening fundamentally is we are arguing over definitions. And we're arguing over definitions because we, as a, as a nation, refuse to define terms. And if there was ever a term that we needed to define, it's racism. And if there was ever a, if there was ever something that we needed to realize is that the opposite of being racist is being anti-racist. That there's no such thing as a not racist. There's no such thing as a race neutral policy. These, all of these sort of middling terms really don't exist and I really take the reader through that, particularly sort of through my life. And, and one of the things that I found in, in, in talking about this book with young people, particularly college students, is they've stated that first and foremost, a lot of the things that I shared and critiqued about myself really gave them freedom to reflect on themselves because chances are they were going through the same thing but didn't really have the language to really understand the way in which this world is racialized and the way in which they're interacting and moving through this world. But, but also, what I've found that they've said is, you know what, it's given me clarity. It, it's given, I want to be someone who's committed to racial and social justice. I want to be a part of this struggle against racism, but I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what I can challenge. I don't even know if it's even possible to undermine racism itself. And so fundamentally, I, you know, students, not only does it give them this clarity, but it also gives them this conviction that change is possible, but then it also gives them direction of how we fundamentally as a nation and as individuals can create that change. And, and as many of you know, and I'm gonna shut up because uh, my time is almost off. Uh, as many of you know, we have spent quite a bit of time particularly, in, I think, in a good way, in the last five years, <laughs> really speaking and talking about the existence of racism. And I say five years. Some of us have been talking about it for longer than that. But, but what we haven't been doing enough of is imagining a different type of human, imagining a different type of institution, imagining a different type of society, and what that looks like. And I know for young people, they're like, just don't tell me the problem, tell me the solution. And tell it to me straight. And I, I felt, and I wanted to essentially give it to them straight through my own story. Thank you.